Controversy in Carmel tonight. The city's majestic open-air forest theater is the setting for a dramatic tug of war. The conflict is over how to renovate the 77-year-old theater. The issue was brought before Carmel's Cultural Commission today, and our Graham Ledger has its decision. Graham? Jan, Joe, the Cultural Commission's meeting was short but hardly sweet for the Forest Theater Guild. The commission voted unanimously to form an ad hoc committee to study and come up with the best renovation plan. It was not what the Guild wanted. Let it not be forgot, there was once a spot called Camelot. And to Donna Merrick and others like her, Carmel's Forest Theater is their Shangri-La. And the Guild has been here on the premises since 1910. And productions have been going on here for 77 consecutive years. Alas, there is trouble in this Camelot. The Forest Theater has become center stage for a bitter controversy. Right now, there is such a lack of storage space that scenery is thrown away each year. We can't store it, and the wood rots if it's left outside. The curtain came up on the controversy Monday during a meeting of Carmel's Cultural Committee. Members of Monterey's Grovemont Arts Center objected to the Force Theater Guild's $100,000 renovation plan. The dialogue became abrasive. They've basically uh, torn apart some measurements and said they're inaccurate and that there, are, uh, there is no reason for certain storage areas which have been accommodated in those plans. And basically it's a lot of pettiness, to be quite honest. The remodeling includes new seats, a new stage floor, and a 12-foot storage area behind the stage. It is that storage building that turns this act ugly. That's the building that I have a problem with. It's, it's essentially creating a back wall at the Outdoor Forest Theater, and at 12 feet tall, and it would sort of really detract from what I think is you know, one of the most beautiful things about the Outdoor Forest. But the conflict has a second scene that goes beyond the staging disagreement. Remember, this is the Carmel's Forest Theater. Uh, it, it's not Monterey's, it's Carmel's, and it has been here for 77 years. And I think we're all tenants, and we all should have a say in, in whatever goes on there, because we all do share the space. Trouble in Camelot. And that trouble apparently far from over. The resentment is still obviously there, and the ad hoc committee may help with a renovation plan but not with the bad blood. By the way, the committee's first meeting is Wednesday. All right, stay tuned for Act yeah. 2. All right. Thank, Thank you, Graham. Graham. Preserving land. Weather reports with Jim Vanderswan, Dennis Lennon on sports, and the Emmy Award-winning Action News Team. This is Action News. Good evening. Nice to have you with us tonight. Traffic congestion is on the minds of many tonight in the city of Salinas. And with new businesses popping up like weeds around town, traffic along Laurel, Davis, even Main Street is very, very bad. Cars and trucks are bumper to bumper, and it's happening more often than ever before. Our Graham Ledger is standing by right now at one of Salinas' busiest intersections. Graham? Joe, rush hour is more or less over, but as you can see behind me, the congestion remains. Now, traffic engineers grade congestion with A being the least traffic and F being the most. This intersection along Davis Road is definitely an F. The, there's a confusion coming around that curve with the, the roads that come into here as to going straight ahead. Very bad. It's very, very bad. How bad? Six years ago, about 7,000 cars traveled along Davis Road near 101 each day. Today, it's 30,000 after minor modifications. Area residents are tired of life in the slow lane. I just think it's too, way, way out of hand. It seems like the whole system, whoever's running things, is a, they're a bit in the Stone Age. It's a bit archaic the way they've actually set up these signs and the speed limit signs. This intersection along North Davis Road is considered one of the busiest in all of Salinas. Davis is the only main artery between 101 to the north and Market Street to the south. It's a situation Mayor-elect Russ Jeffries wants to avoid in the future. And some of the members of the past council have felt, go ahead and put the project in, we'll take care of the traffic later. Well, you can see what kind of problems we're in now. But while much of the problem could have been avoided, traffic is a healthy byproduct of growth. And growing is exactly what Salinas is doing. In 1980, the city's population was just over 80,000. By January of this year, it hit 97 plus. And by 1991, it's estimated the population will swell to more than 104,000 residents. So it's clear the city's traffic department can't remain on cruise control anymore. 
and the issue of traffic congestion can no longer take a back seat to development. We need to tell the developers uh, what Salinas wants instead of the developers coming and telling Salinas what they should have. And we're doing that with the general plan process. And once the general plan is completed, it will outline what Salinas will be like in the next 20 years. Now, besides the general plan, another way to help combat the traffic problem is a proposed half-cent sales tax hike. Now, that money would be used to clean up the current roadway system in Salinas. Joe? What is the status of that uh, sales tax increase, Graham? Well, Councilwoman Price Mira told me that we could see that issue on the ballot by next year. And ironically, right now, the signal has just gone out and there is a massive tie-up. Back to you, Joe. Just adding to the problems. All right, thank you, Graham. Mayor-elect Russ Jeffries. This is Action News. Good evening. Nice to have you with us tonight. Some of the residents of Marina say they are in shock tonight following word of two separate sexual attacks on three young children. The suspect is at large, and although the incidents happened last Wednesday, police did not begin warning people until today. Uh, Graham Ledger is standing by now where one of those attacks took place. Graham? Joe, this isn't the kind of incident city officials like to publicize, but you have to wonder why the police waited until now to let residents know about it and to release the composite sketch. And because of that, some residents are mad. It's the kind of thing that can devastate a neighborhood. But what's even more frustrating for Diana Matthews is not being told about it. I, I think it's just awful that we didn't get some kind of warning, some kind of, this is the description of the person, this is where we suspect the person is from or whatever, nothing. I mean, it just absolutely shocks me. The sexual attacks happened Wednesday afternoon within 20 minutes of each other. Police say a four-year-old and a six-year-old were molested at an apartment building in the 3300 block of Del Monte Avenue. Unfortunately, the tragedy didn't stop there. The suspect left the Del Monte Avenue apartment complex and came here to this one on Seacrest, where a third child was sexually molested. His third victim, a five-year-old. It happened Wednesday, and the police department didn't get the sketch out until today and, and the warning to, to residents. Oh, Does that kidding. kind of make you mad? Oh, you're kidding. No. I have, see, I haven't even gotten a warning. I heard it through some of the other parents. Is there any reason for waiting this long? Why not let people know any earlier? Um, basically, this was the most uh, convenient time, and also we didn't have a composite picture available until late Friday. But it wasn't until today that a composite picture of the suspect was released. He is described as a white male, about six feet tall, 170 pounds, with brown hair, a mustache, and wearing prescription glasses. He's believed to be about 30 years old. Police are asking residents to watch for the suspect, and residents are warning the suspect to watch out. I try to break him in half if at all possible. You know, they're, 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 there's, there's no excuse for anything like that. Again, these guys are sick, and they don't need to be out here on the streets. Now, besides a composite picture, police also have information about the suspect's car. It's described as a Ford Pinto with pinstriping, partial license plate, of IS, of course, anyone with information about that car is asked to call police. Joe? Now, how about uh, positive, definite leads, Graham? Anything like that so far? Well, police say they have a few leads right now. The most tangible, besides the car and the sketch, is a couple of eyewitness accounts to the attacks. All right. Thank you, Graham. If you uh, recognize the suspect or you have any information, the number at the Marina... California Rodeo in Salinas is still more than a week away, but already the pre-Rodeo festivities are underway. And if you know anything at all about the event, you know that it is all kicked off with the annual Big Hat Barbecue. The barbecue features food, drink, dancing, and uh, plenty of each one of those. Uh, Graham Ledger is standing by right now at the Monterey County Sheriff's Posse Grounds. Graham? Joe, I'm a city boy, born and raised. I used to think a stirrup was something you did to chocolate milk. But it's events like these that make me wish I was a cowboy. This is the Big Hat uh, Barbecue. And big is the right word, because about 5,000 people are here this year. And standing with me now is the chairman of the Big Hat Barbecue. It's uh, Billy Walker. Billy, can you give us a little bit of a history behind the, the barbecue itself? Well, obviously, it's uh, designed to uh, kick off the big week, uh, which is part of the California Rodeo. But uh, and uh, it's also for, so that we can make enough funds to survive another year. Uh, but uh, if uh, if this continues, uh, I hope uh, 
I mean, it looks like the weather's going to stay with us. Uh, we'll have uh, more than 5,000 this this year. Now, this is the 41st year of the barbecue. 41st year, yes, that's correct. Now, where does the money go once you've raised it? Uh, it uh, like I said, it helps us survive for another year, but most of the monies uh, are used to put on uh, the junior rodeo and uh, other events for the blind kids. We have a rodeo for them there in September, but uh, we give them buckles and saddles and so forth, and without uh, this money here, we couldn't do it, of course. Now, uh, that's the history. Fine. What does it mean this year? What have you got? Anything in store as far as the rodeo goes? Well, uh, I guess I'll uh, be there again donating my money like we did last year. Of course, Joe was there as well. He, he was out here last year, as a matter of fact, doing a gig such as this. So, uh, as far as the barbecue goes, it is uh, the lead-up event for the rodeo, then? The beginning. Okay. Thank you very much, Billy Walker, chairman of the Big Hat Barbecue. And uh, as I said, big is just the word. To the right of me, beer. To the left of me, a band. Behind me, all the food, which I'm going to go taste in just a few seconds. And uh, we're going to throw it back to you, Joe. Yeah, it's too bad you let Billy get away. I'd like to ask him about donating his money there. Uh, how late do they open? How late can you go out and, and get the food and drink there, Graham? Well, I don't think there's any official deadline here. I think people are going to party until they pass out, as they say. All right. Uh, you know, it's, it's where the men are wild and the women are worse. Yeah, you go. go ahead. Have a good time. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> and looks like he will have a good time. That's all the news. At now, day one of the Rodeo is winding down right now, but as our Graham Ledger was there today for the fun, and he is back now at the Rodeo grounds with the story for us. Graham? Joe, all of the day's activities took place just a few feet from me to my right in the Rodeo grounds. Not that there isn't any action going on right here. There's plenty of it. But no matter where today's seat, everyone was treated to quite a show on quite a day. Follow your parking directors, please. Lee Brooks isn't a cowboy, but he is a wrangler of sorts. He herds Mustangs and Broncos of the steel variety. Follow your parking directors, please. Are they following the parking directors? To some extent. You always have one or two that, that doesn't follow anybody. But nine out of ten are going to follow them pretty good. Lee sits high above the parking lot. To his left, cars. To his right, a bird's eye view of all the other action. Get your ice cream. Go on. Ice cream. One of the early arrivals to the Rodeo, Cecilia Madalora. Each year, she wants to be sure she doesn't miss a thing. How long have you been coming to the Rodeo? Oh, a long time. Since, I guess, the 19th, before the war and then after the war, so, you know. They're the best. Here's a man with a good seat, announcer Mel Lambert, a 36-year Rodeo veteran. This is a chance to see the Old West come alive. But the ultimate seat has got to be here. This is called the pit. Looks remarkably like a bomb shelter, and for good reason. Well, they had a bareback fall down in here. Once he went right through the fence, the whole thing came down, and he lived down in here. That was, uh, you know, quite a few years ago. Hey, look at here, Steve Carter. Huh? A steel horse cowboys are a lot safer up with the band. Near all those lovely Miss California Rodeo contestants. From Santa Maria. And of course, Joe, I am standing with the winner of the 1987 Miss California Rodeo contest, and she is Patty Pollard of Santa Maria. Congratulations, Patty. Thank you very much. What does something like this mean to you? It means the world to me. For example, what? Uh, it means that I beat five girls which are equal to me, but I did a little bit better than them in each event. Now, what do the events consist of? What do you have to do to win this title? You have two reining patterns, one which you ride on your own horse, and the other you trade horses, which this counts for 40% of the score. Then for another 50%, you have personality and appearance, and 10% is scholastic. Okay, and uh, obviously you're going to take this title home and uh, party with your friends, I'm sure. Well, maybe the first part, not the second. <laughs> okay, wear the title well. Thank you very much, Patty Pollard, the winner of the 1987 Miss California Rodeo Contest. Of course, her reign is just beginning, and the Rodeo itself is just beginning. Day one under its belt, three days to go. Joe? Thank you, Graham, and pass along our congratulations to Pat. Will do. Now, if you... Uh... Male adults. Somewhere between Hollister and Gilroy lies about 3,600 acres of land. Right now, it's farmland. But a group of developers has some bigger plans for that property. They want to build a city there. To the south of us down there. So with the hills on this side 
And the freeway on this side, or the Highway 25, with the river on that boundary, we could have created a complete island, so we're not really affecting any other property. And then we're going to leave. This is Stanley Kazeski's Shangri La, so or at least a reasonable totally facsimile. Animated. He and several others want to transform these 3,600 acres of farmland into a thriving, self sufficient city of up to 30,000. Kazeski says it's a rare chance to start an entire town from square one. And here we had an opportunity with a piece of flat land, a large piece of flat land, to focus the development attention all in one spot. But progress has its price. This is alfalfa, about 30 acres of it. It's also exactly where one of two golf courses is planned to be built. Six farmers currently lease this land, including this man, who didn't want to talk on camera. He was afraid that if he spoke his mind about the development, the ax would fall that much quicker. But Kazaski says only a few will get hurt by it. Yeah, we've had a very difficult time leasing the land out. Uh, of this 3,600 acres, there's a lot of it that's not leased right now. Is this just a sign of the times for farming, or are they paving paradise to put up a parking lot? The decision will be up to the San Benito Planning Commission. But it looks like, if things go as planned, the road of progress will be paved right here. Developers are looking at about 11,000 homes at an initial cost of $120 million just for essentials. They go before the Planning Commission with their plan in about three weeks. Tony Chappelle will tell us if Big Week in Salinas will also be a sunny one. And the Far East, not too far off for the night. California's Board of Forestry toured the devastated area of Pebble Beach today. More than 40 people saw firsthand the fire-ravaged region nearly one month after the blaze. For some, it was a sobering experience. Two months ago, this might have been just another tour bus ride along Pebble Beach's 17-mile drive. But today, these people aren't interested in the million-dollar view. It's this, the million-dollar destruction they want to see. Franklin Barnes came all the way from San Diego because he knows it could happen right in his backyard. The problems represented by the Pebble Beach fire, the brush and the interfacing with uh, residential developments is a statewide problem. It occurs in a larger and more hazardous areas in San Diego County, north clear up into the uh, uh, Oregon border. So for Frank Barnes and the three dozen others here, the purpose of this tour is twofold to find out what went wrong, and to learn from it so it doesn't happen in the future. For most of these people, this is their first view of life after the fire in Pebble Beach. For most, it was a shock. Oh, it's tragic. The blackness is the same, and, and you, you see the houses that got took by the volcano. Many just looked on in disbelief. Others felt compelled to document the devastation. Are you going to do any seeding? Some of these trees may not, uh, may not be too badly off after all. There's a little bit of green budding in some of these trees. But while there's hope for the plants and trees, the future is in the hands of homeowners. We're just afraid people move back. There is more rain in the forecast in northern Italy tonight. Three days of torrential storms being blamed for at least 26 deaths so far. Most of the dead swept away in a mudslide in the township of Torreno. The slide destroyed a block of homes and nearly buried a hotel. 2,000 soldiers have been put on standby to help with rescue operations. Swollen rivers and landslides have also blocked many roads in south Switzerland, leading to the evacuation of hundreds of houses and several campgrounds. Meantime, the stalemate continues tonight between the French and Iranian governments. French riot police continue to surround the Iranian embassy in Paris. An Iranian official took refuge there three weeks ago. He is wanted for questioning about bombings in France last year. In retaliation, the, the Iranians have surrounded the French embassy in Tehran. The French foreign minister says his country's demand to question the Iranian official is not negotiable. For the first time, a black... It was. Our Graham Ledger found today was a day for central coasters to get away from it all. They call it Labor Day, but it doesn't look like these people are laboring very much. It must be leisure labor. 
For Gary Migdahl and friends, today, life's a beach. Just hanging out at the beach, uh, enjoying the weather, some wine. Having a good time? Having a good time. <laughs> Must be Labor Day if they're playing football again. Little do they know, local police didn't take the day off and are ticketing all their cars. It's a labor of law. Ticket can kind of ruin a, a day off for a lot of people. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, somebody's got to do it. we got to work. Tickets are what these people at the aquarium are waiting for. Guess that's a labor line. We found it'd be appropriate to check the maternity ward on Labor Day, but the hospital didn't. You guys are going to need to pick up your stuff and leave, all right? Now, here's Mike Bojato laboring on Labor Day because his neighbor couldn't stand his front yard anymore. It's just been very, very bad, yes. In fact, uh, if Jim Barnes were still mayor across the street, there probably would have been police action. <laughs> also, I decided to put it in on Labor Day instead of kicking back and having a tall cooling. <laughs> Nothing like a little lawn labor on Labor Day. Yep, you got it. This is how I spent my Labor Day at the beach, in the sun, reading the newspaper. Well, now that the boss knows, guess I'd better start checking the help wanted section. In Carmel, at the beach, Graham Ledger, Action News 8. Tough job, but someone has to do it. Dr. Dean Adele tells us tonight about a new study. Real town, but in Washington, the trophy. With the Irish leading 5-0, Brown returns this punt 70 yards for the score. Now, this guy looks like Graham when it comes time to pay the bar tab. Notre Dame leads the Spartans 12 to nothing. <laughs> duty today here. Thanks very much. Now, uh, our Graham Ledger has uh, also been here all day and uh, has been keeping us up to date on some of the problems of uh, people who have been trying to get out of Laguna Seca. And a lot, of, a lot of those people are still here. Graham is standing by live with an update, an overall look at an update at what's going on at this moment. Graham? Joe, Margo, it was a glorious day for about 60 to 70,000 people, a disastrous day for about 30,000 others. Some of them are still here. According to a papal visit source, up to 30,000 people were turned away from going to the park because there were not enough buses, that only 100 of the 900 buses even showed up, and incredibly, that a transportation contract was never entered into. Papal visit officials won't confirm the reports tonight. Still, the event itself was a sight to behold. Laguna Seca at dawn was picture perfect. Laguna Seca, one hour later, was shrouded in a cloak of fog. But by 9.30, the fog had lifted, and all eyes were fixed on the most dynamic pope in recent history. excitement here, a subtle excitement, a buzz like no other. Almost in unison, the crowd will stand and cheer or wave at the pontiff. A certain sense of serene calm engulfs Laguna Seca, filling it with an almost surreal, inexplicable feeling of warmth and peace. deeply reflective. Some of the faithful joined in song. Others merely stood and listened, almost in awe. The pontiff's sermon, a hard-hitting warning. Be careful not to forget the Lord, your God. As expected, Pope John Paul II discussed the importance of agriculture and hard work. He urged the crowd to work together toward solidarity. May the Lord's face shine on this land, on the church in Monterey, and on all America, from sea to shining sea. Amen. 
Following Mass, it was a Hilo ride to Carmel and rave reviews from the faithful. Your impressions of the Mass today? Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, John Paul really gave a good uh, uh, Mass to all the people here. Oh, it was wondrous. It was, it was once in a lifetime happening. I feel, feel very, uh, oh, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm, I just don't have any words for it. Pretty much the response across the board today. Too bad for the people who were denied access to the park. Now, for those people who are still here, they're trying to get home, and one of them is uh, Brian Little of Hanford, California. He is trying to get ho home right now. And, Brian, how long have you been waiting to try and get back to where you belong? Uh, since about 1.30. What have they been telling you? Uh, they've been saying uh, the parking lot up here is too crowded. They can't get the buses in to take the people out. So uh, what do you think of the whole situation here? Was it worth coming up here and going through all this? Oh, it was still worth to see the Pope. But uh, a little bit uh, ticked off about the transportation situation. Yeah, I would like to get home. Okay, okay good luck, Brian, and uh, we hope you will get home. I'm sure you will. It's just a matter of when. Uh, Joe and Margo, Captain Chatterton of the Monterey County Sheriff's Department probably put it best. When I asked him what was going on, he said the transportation system here has totally collapsed. And now it is up to the Sheriff's Department to try and piece this thing back together. Now, Graham, a couple of the people I talked to uh, down there, uh, down below us, uh, said that they were from out of town. And that a big part of the problem was that the, uh, some of the regular charter buses had been uh, commandeered, more or less, uh, for shuttle buses. And that left a lot of out-of-towners out of luck. Are most of the people down there from, from uh, points distant, or are they from this area? Right now, uh, most of the people I have talked to are from points uh, far away, mostly Central California or maybe even Northern California, and they're just stuck and they are waiting for some sort of word of when they're going to get out of here. When it's going to happen uh, isn't known right now. The Sheriff's Department figures that maybe up to half the people are still here. Mm, doesn't look like it'll be anytime soon either. Thank you very much. September 17th, the day thousands waited and planned for, the day Pope John Paul II touched our lives. Little did they know that this joyous event would become ugly and, quite frankly, out of control. The only way out of here was by bus. That's the way the Papal Visit Office planned it. But by early afternoon, it was clear their plan had failed. I think it was uh, the worst mess that I've ever been in. Uh, I said to my husband, except for uh, something that might have happened, you know, a tragedy in our own family or something like that. I can't compare it to anything that's ever happened to me. For Lola Westeridge and her friend Joyce Cook, yesterday was a study in dehumanization. For them, it wasn't worth it. We could not go to, to our beds last night and go to sleep without trying to do something for these poor, pitiful people that were herded out in this field like animals to wait. There was no way for these folks to get out. The last of the faithful did finally get out of Laguna Seca, but not until 11 p.m., almost 24 hours after many people began their day at the park. About 40 worshipers never made it home. But it, it looked at about um, 5 o'clock, it looked like the volunteers had lost total control of it, and so uh, I just kind of stepped in and says, um, I'm going to take over the loudspeaker system. The man responsible for the papal transportation plan? Jim Cooney. Today, he refused to talk on camera, but claimed his plan was 99.9% .9 successful, and that by 7 o'clock, most of the people had been bussed out. Other people say 10 to 15,000 were still standing there, waiting. We're talking about a man who worked hard for nine months to make sure that this went right and saw things go wrong. Sometimes it's very difficult for people to admit um, that things have gone wrong, and I think that's an answer from somebody who is looking at the overall effect of yesterday's visit. Spiritually, the visit was a glorious success. Lo uh, Tony, Jim Tony's already got. Logistically, it was a nightmare. Okay. okay. <laughs> This is Action News 8 Weekend. Good evening. At 11 o'clock, the San Francisco Giants are packing their bags for St. Louis tonight, one win away from the World Series. The Giants humbabied their way to a 6-3 victory today at Candlestick Park. This may have been the last Giants game ever at the stick, even if it isn't. This was a day to remember. 
16 years of frustrating teams and cold candlestick nights can do strange things to you once a winner comes along. Hey, Jack, help me out! Some Giants fans do know the score and what it means to have a winner. Oh, God, this means heaven. You, I mean, you, you can't believe what this is like. Giants fans can be at one moment uncivilized and the next be the splitting image of the city. Yet on this day, there is a great equalizer, one unifying theme, Hum Baby. Hum Baby. Hum Baby, Hum Baby. When the Giants come to town, it's Hum Hum Baby. This baby is still too young to hum, but San Francisco's finest were humming right along today, handing out tickets. San Franciscans are known for being posh and pompous sometimes and not into things as mundane as baseball. But you can lay that idea to rest right here and now right. in Section E. That's right. Blair! Yeah! Blair! Yeah! Blair! Yeah. 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 Get off of my edge! Get out of my baseball league! Go home, bring on the Tigers! Inside the stick, the frenzy builds. I think they're going to win the day, and they're going to go to, uh, to, to St. Louis. I think they're going to take the next, the next two straight. A prediction nearing prophecy. More, more, more. They got more, much more than anyone would have thought from the 1987 Giants. And there is more to come on the Giants and their victory later in the newscast from Pete Delgado in sports. Viola, who won two of the games, and then the players bathed themselves with the traditional champagne shampoo. Oh, Typical night at Graham's house. The Twins become the first Minnesota franchise to capture a world championship since the 1953-54 Minneapolis Lakers. Addicts liken it to a runner's high. It is a feeling of euphoria when heroin is used for the first time. It's a narcotic responsible for ruining millions of adult lives. Millions more may follow, but now there is a new victim of heroin, children. Our Graham Ledger has the first of a four-part close-up series on kids using heroin. Graham? Margot, Joe, it is a tragedy, no less. It might be a little hard to swallow, but in Monterey County, children as young as 10 years old, fifth graders, are using heroin. For those kids, it is the end of innocence and a normal childhood and the beginning of a life of crime and grime. I was uh, 12 years old when I started using. And the ages have ranged, uh, our youngest assessment so far has been 10 years old. And uh, the normal age, age range is around 15. I work the streets, yeah, to support a drug habit. Young kids are doing it, and it don't matter what race they are. Mexican kids, black kids, Caucasian kids. It's not really $20 worth. You can buy this. You can buy On the streets, it, it is known as black. We think of a dark, deadly subculture of adults whose only goal each day, each hour, is a fix. Come on, baby. Fail me now. Now, it has given birth to a new breed of addicts. Heroin is carving its ugly path through high school campuses and playgrounds. Children are using heroin. I'll shoot up around, sometimes up to around 16 times a day. There's a lot of heroin around. There's a lot of it in Salinas. There's that black tar heroin. You can, there isn't a day that doesn't go by when you can pick up the paper and see somebody getting popped for it. If you notice, some of those ages of the dealers is getting younger also. So it's getting into the schools. It's getting uh, to the kids at a much earlier start. And once they, they start to use it, it's, uh, it's very hard to get off of it. Isn't it? It is the availability of heroin, the extreme ease of finding it, that enhances the problem. How easy is it to get drugs? These teenagers at Salinas High will tell you it's no more difficult than crossing the street. The kids know who's doing it, and uh, they come out there, and they move around just like everybody else, so you don't get a certain set pattern on them. This is the man kids call Grizzly Adams. James Prola can be found on Main Street in Salinas at lunchtime or when school lets out. He positions himself directly across the street from Salinas High School. Prola, Grizzly Adams, has been arrested for, but never convicted of, dealing drugs. They'll walk up, hand them money, and get something back, and they're gone. 
boom, 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 boom. He walks down the street with them and he, 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 he does his deals and then he leaves, burns people sometimes. Photographer Rich Quintana, equipped with a hidden camera, asked students where he could buy some heroin. This student said he didn't do drugs, but knew where to get them. It's easy to get everywhere. It's everywhere. You see a lot of kids doing drugs, doing the youngest, specifically. The youngest I seen them was around 10 years old, shooting up heroin. So the kids are definitely getting younger. So the person that says, hey, you know, that stuff is crazy, it don't even exist. Well, maybe they should get out and uh, check it out. You know that there's a lot of people here that think, yeah, that may happen, but it happens somewhere else. People in Monterey say it happens in Salinas. The people in Salinas say, well, it happens in L.A. or in San Jose. That's true. It does happen there, too, but it's happening here. And I think the longer we, as a community, continue this denial, the, the, it's, it's going to just hurt us in the long run. For most parents, the thought of a 10-year-old, their 10-year-old, shooting up heroin is outlandish, unbelievable, but it is happening. And it is happening with regularity. If the drug is devastating to a grown-up, imagine what damage it can do to kids, and that's something we'll look at a little bit later this week. Now, how widespread do authorities say this problem is? What, for instance, is the percentage of young people using heroin? Police say it is really hard to tell. They figure about 4,000 heroin addicts in the city of uh, Salinas itself Maybe about 5% of those, or 200, are kids under the age of 18, but those are rough estimates, and mm -hmm. they just don't know for sure, but it is a problem. Yeah, mm. frightening problem, yes. too. Thank you, Thanks, Graham. Graham. Finding a solution to the homeless I regret it. An awful lot, I do regret it. I don't like the idea of my past being like that, but nobody can change that. I can't change it. Stephanie's past had little chance of being anything but regrettable. Growing up in East Salinas, says Stephanie, in a home where drugs on the kitchen table were as common but more coveted than food. She went to Lincoln Elementary, among others, but by age 12 buckled under pressure at home and dropped out before the eighth grade. Two years later, Stephanie ran away from home. That was the beginning of a chaotic, lewd lifestyle, a lifestyle of danger, drugs, and sex, a lifestyle that peaked here in the grit and decadence of Salinas' red light district. At 14, I started prostitution because I had to do something in me as means of support to support myself. And then her boyfriend told her I was trying to get a piece of him. And she told me, she goes, well, you're either going to have to pay rent or you're going to have to get out. And I said, how do you expect me to pay rent without a job? She said, the same way I do. And you know how she did it? turning tricks. Prostitution. I wondered what the drug was like, and then I had to use something to come down off my coke high because I was too up, too high. And I had to, walk, I had to keep going in, at night. I'd be, my eyeballs, my pupils, you could not see the color of my eye. That's how much coke I used. I was so loaded, you could not see the color of my eye at all, and that's how big my pupil was. I had to use the heroin to bring the pupil in my eye smaller. I went to go visit my mom and dad one day, right before I was picked up for prostitution. I went to go visit them. Then my dad picked me up by my, my shirt collar like this, and he threw me out the front door and says, we don't want a junkie for a daughter. You know what that feels like? I didn't care. I just did it. I didn't care. I was so loaded most of the time. I just, my mind just said, forget the world, just do it. Get your dope. At age 15, Stephanie was speedballing, mixing heroin with cocaine a rush that lasted only a couple of hours before the inevitable craving, the craving for more. Her habit ballooned to $500 a day. The only way to pay for it was to hit the streets, even if the streets hit back. And they let me go scot-free. They let me go because I had agreed to snitch somebody off. A dealer? A dealer, and I didn't do it. I told the cops I would, and then when I left, I went and got loaded. I said, forget them. This summer, Stephanie was finally locked up, this time for prostitution. At age 16, she has seen more crime, more drugs, more filth than most people would see in a lifetime. She has seen enough. So what, what now, when you go from here? Home, after I get out, home, and back to school, get myself a job, straighten up. 
tired of living my life like that. I don't want to be a user and abuser. I want to live. Stephanie begins her new life when she's released from custody three days before Christmas. In Salinas, Graham Ledger, Action News 8. There she goes. See the register. When you pull it up twice, you get the extra rush. Okay. Me, I just shoot it in. Speedballing, shooting a mixture of heroin and cocaine. Addicts say the combination speeds you up, then brings you down. Patty, who's been using since she was 17, will tell you just how far down. All I want to do is quit. I want to get away from this. And I, ha I have no kind of option, no kind of nothing. I have no family. I have nothing. You know, my babies were took away from me. While I was in jail. Tracy, who is 17, has used heroin and abused cocaine for years. She is hoping to swap the main line of drugs for the mainstream of life. Well, hopefully I'll stay straight. I'm trying. Is it tough? It's tough. And hopefully I can keep her out of stuff. But when somebody's been used to living for the last 16, 17 years one way, I mean, it's hard. You know, you can't just say, you know, poof, you're changed, you know? It's going to be hard. For children who use heroin, the effects can be particularly corrosive. It puts normal growth on hold and opens the door to a whole host of long-term physical damage. Anyone who injects a drug is, is engaging the very worst, most dangerous form of drug abuse. And in, uh, in a child, presumably a 14, 15-year-old is in school, of course, uh, forget about school and academic performance uh, for that person. Uh, the effects uh, may be devastating because of the uh, bacterial contamination, uh, the effects on the heart. But it is the psychological scarring that may run deeper than the physical. Heroin addicts rise above a line of normalcy when they're high. Once they come down, there is a perpetual need to get back up again. Only problem is they never again reach that original high. It is an emotional tug of war whose casualty is adolescence. So therefore you have a child who is always is a child. So the child's lifestyle focuses around uh, scoring his drug right, and be able to continue the addiction. So this may set the child up for a whole host of psychological damage. <laughs> so here's some plastic. What's that? That's what the dope was wrapped in. The heroin? Yeah, the heroin or cocaine. One or the other. Inner city hotels, once offering classy comfort to a generation now long gone, are heroin havens. There, the nuclear family can erode to a household of hypes. We see a lot of family addiction where the heroin addiction may be passed on from generation to generation. After all, our children uh, learn from their parents, and uh, if they're learning to be addicts, that's what they learn to do. There was a young lady, she was 12 years old. She had tracks, man, real, real nasty tracks. She was even shooting between her toes, and sometimes inside her bikini area. Uh, it's kind of sad to watch a young girl like that squirm around the floor, you know, going through the withdrawals. It is a sad scene, one beyond description. One Tracy wants to avoid. Well, usually when they see me, while well, they think that she's never going to make nothing of herself, that she's just the same person as she is, but I guess one day I'll prove, well, I'll prove them wrong. I say she has a 50-50 chance. Even odds in a lopsided lifestyle. In Salinas, Graham Ledger, Action News 8. Until recently, it has been considered exclusively an adult problem, but now heroin use is no longer restricted to grown-ups. Children are using heroin, an unfortunate reality we've been looking into all this week. Our Graham Ledger here now with the final part of his four-part series. Well, Margot, Joe, the sad part is most of these children who are using heroin are only following by example. A common denominator among many is parental drug abuse. But some will still get hooked on heroin regardless if their parents use, so there is very real need to inform and warn about its dangers. And what better teachers than kids who have been there? And I, I ended up in the hospital on OD. I came that close to dying. Any more questions? Stephanie's is an open-ended question with a very closed answer. Stephanie is 16, a heroin addict who sold herself on the streets to support her habit. 
Now she's here at Juvenile Hall behind bars, locked up, but with a message bursting to get out. Stay away from drugs. Stephanie, like countless others who have been locked behind these walls, learned the hard way from experience. But now these walls, which have for so long stifled and shut down, are beginning to open up and echo a message, a warning to other kids. If a kid's going to do 30 days, instead of just sitting here for 30 days, learning a whole bunch of negative stuff from other kids, give him a chance to go out and uh, use the negative things that he's done in a positive way. Well, where'd you get the drugs from? Streets. Streets. It's out there. It's everywhere. It's called Be Aware, and that's exactly what these kids tell other children and their parents. The overriding theme at these sessions, drugs can damage, heroin can kill. To me, my cousin took us out to the back roads, uh, and, uh, to this one place. It's a dead end, and he just, we were in the back seat, and he just turned around and started shooting us. Shot us these three times. The man who shot him, his uncle, a heroin addict. Carmelo was only six years old. Well, picture your young boy or your young girl, 11, 12 years old, you know, squirming around the floor, you know? And that's sad. The purpose here is not to shock, but to open an eye or two which may be closed to the cold, hard realities of adolescence and drugs and to open a dialogue between kids who have been there and parents whose children may be headed there. Did she ever comfort you? Did she ever told you, stay away from it? Listening now, these young faces, faces not yet emotionally scarred by drugs and crime, faces still being sculptured by environment, but most importantly, by education. Hopefully you guys won't uh, decide to take this uh, little visit here as a joke. Okay, because they did at one time, because they used to sit where you're sitting, okay? But they decided to push it. So, now they're sitting over here. And if uh, the young kids out in the schools, if they don't want to listen to uh, judges, to cops, or maybe even the counselors, maybe they'll listen to the young kids that we're taking over there because they've been there. You know what, you guys are lucky. You still have your parents. I didn't have mine for four and a half years. I didn't. Four and a half years, I was out getting beat up, raped, and molested. Those were four and a half years of nothing but pure hell. Kind of says it all. Now, there are some ways to ensure something like this doesn't happen to your children. Experts say there are more or less four things to do. One, build a strong self-image of your child. Two, create positive role models. Three, make time to be with your children. Four, teach them about the effects of drugs. These steps don't guarantee anything, but it could help prevent a tragedy. And really, kids using heroin is nothing less than a major tragedy. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the word for it. Thanks, Thank you, Graham. Graham. Yeah. KSBW 8, the news starts now. From the most watched station on the Central Coast, Graham Ledger, Maya Carroll, Tony Chappelle Weather, Pete Delgado Sports. This is Action News 8, weekend. Good evening, at six o'clock, Central Coast retailers are breathing an early sigh of relief tonight following the surprising surge in shopper interest this holiday season. Recent troubles on Wall Street prompted fear that shoppers would hold back rather than spend this year. But that apparently isn't the case. Our John Lobertini standing by live at Northridge Mall in Salinas with more. John? Great. The wall may be gone, but the emotions and memories remain. Today in Monterey, local Vietnam veterans got together to honor more than 350 volunteers who helped with the Vietnam War Memorial while it was in Monterey. Portable wall was on display during the week of the 11th. Today, all the people who helped construct the wall, as well as provide emotional support for visitors, retreated to a spaghetti feed. And in a tearful ceremony, a special few were given commemorative plaques. Forever moving wall. And I thank you all. Thank you. Vietnam veterans today also honoring the local news media. Action News 8 receiving three awards. Certificates of appreciation going to reporters John Lobertini and Paul Johnsich, as well as news director Michael Crump.
Help is on the way to rattled and rolled Southern California tonight. Governor George Duke Majin today paving the way for emergency help. Duke Majin proclaimed a state of emergency in Imperial County, which was struck by two major earthquakes this week. Damage estimates range from a half a million dollars to four million dollars, most of it to highways, roads, and buildings. The governor's decision opens the door for low interest loans, tax relief, and disaster aid. Quakes of 6.0 and 6.3 hit within 12 hours of each other. Monday and Tuesday. This weekend, the long holiday weekend, is a heavy travel time, much of that traveling done by car. And that means crowded roads and highways. Locally, in Monterey and Santa Cruz counties, only a few moderate accidents today. But of course, what has become an ugly part of holiday weekends, the traffic death count is underway nationwide. It is currently at 315. As of 6 this morning, 48 motorists were killed on the state's roadways. Locally, three fatalities. Sobriety checkpoints are being used again over this holiday weekend in California. Last night in Santa Cruz, this checkpoint was set up by the California Highway Patrol. The results of that crackdown on drunk drivers are in. In all, 533 cars were pulled over. Of those, 36 drivers were actually given sobriety tests, and 11 of those motorists were actually arrested and brought to jail. These are the benefits of working at night, right here. Merry Christmas. Say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Okay, now can you turn around? This tonight, streetwalkers on a mission. A mission against AIDS. Our Graham Ledger has been on Soledad Street tonight and back in the newsroom now. Now, Graham, these men and women... A different kind of streetwalker in the Chinatown area of Salinas tonight, streetwalkers on a mission. A mission against AIDS. Uh, Graham Ledger has been on Soledad Street tonight and back in the newsroom now. Now, Graham, these men and women had some Christmas presents tonight. Well, Joe, they turned some heads on Soledad Street tonight. Many out on the street not quite sure what to make of them or what to make of what was called the ideal Christmas gift for that area. Condoms and bleach. Life on Soledad Street is filled with propositions. Is that understood? Damn you. Often dangerous propositions. Linda Morales knows that, so do her helpers, and that's why they're here. Hi. Hi. How are you, you doing? Good, Fine. Here you go. Thank you. Sure. Tonight, they're giving out more than a little holiday cheer. For these ladies of Soledad Street, an anti-AIDS package, complete with condoms, and bleach to sterilize needles. The Christmas mints are just part of the holiday spirit. These are actually made in Japan. Really? Yeah. So we're hoping by passing out these packages that the word will get around on prevention, how to prevent yourself from getting infected by the virus that causes AIDS. Reactions to these red-hooded holiday health helpers usually beginning with blank looks of astonishment, but mostly ending with, hey, that's a good idea. Number one, I'll take them. Number two, I will give them to my customers because I use those at all times. Would you take them if they gave them you? Yes, I would take them. I would give them to my customers. Who uses needles? I don't use needles. No, not for you. <laughs> you know, for, for, for some of the customers. Oh, my goodness. So it's just kind of convenient for us to be able to come out a little bit before Christmas and do this. And package it. Uh, and package it <laughs> festively. <laughs> Still, even the most festive packaging doesn't sell everyone on the Christmas condoms. I really don't need this because I'm not like that. A response health workers would like to hear more of. Indeed, and the idea really here tonight, if you can't stop prostitution and you can't stop intravenous drug use, then at least you can cut down on the threat and spread of AIDS. Joe? How big an effort was this tonight, Graham? How many of these packages did they hand out? Well, a total of 250 packages were handed out this evening, but well over 500 condoms in all were handed out. Thank you, Graham. Avenues and feasted on a full Christmas meal. Our Graham Ledger was there today. He's in the newsroom now with more. Graham? Tony, the swinging door on Soledad Street swung wide open today. They fed the homeless there, about 1,500 of them. Not much of a Christmas materially, but Christmas is much, much more than that. On this street of despair, this black hole of society, an answer on this day, echoing, slicing through the pestilence. An answer not found under an eight-foot tree, nor in department stores. What is Christmas?
What is Christmas? Christmas is straining to sing when vocal cords are raw from the cold. What is Christmas? Christmas is an 82-year-old man calling on his tired feet to perform like a 20-year-old. What is Christmas? Christmas is frostbitten fingers tickling the ivory with the accuracy of a surgeon. What is Christmas? Christmas is life returning to a face once lost in itself. Very hungry. No, I'm happy. I'm happy for the moment. What is Christmas? Christmas is a sip of warm coffee or a taste of stuffing for those who normally go without. What is Christmas? Christmas is reliving past Christmases and fearing future ones. What is Christmas? I spent the night out in the cold last night along with a lot of my friends. And so I wish I could give, I just wish I had the means. is Christmas. Now what this Christmas may have been short on materialistically obviously made up spiritually a lot of very happy faces on a sad, sad street. Sure are. Thank you very much, Graham. Graham Ledger in the newsroom. The swing weather will continue to do that tomorrow as well. Mm. And then it'll taper off and it's headed for the Rockies. And boy, they are looking for some very bad weather. Current conditions right now, <laughs> see, on the central coast, 47 degrees in Santa Cruz, 49. In Monterey and in Salinas, the barometer 29.79 on the rise. Winds are out of the north about 9 miles an hour, and the humidity at about 83%. We're going to take a look at our U.S. satellite right now. Here's our powerful storm system. It's turning into an even stronger winter storm system right now. Let's see. Try that again. There we go. It's magic. It's called TV. Thunderstorms from Southern California over into portions of Arizona. Winter storm warnings and watches are up tonight for portions of Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and Colorado. We're going to talk about that more in just a minute. First, we're going to check east of the Rockies. A band of light to moderate rain right now from the Gulf all the way up to the northern border. Rain changing to snow in portions of Wisconsin, Illinois, and Michigan. Tomorrow, the central Rockies and Plains going to get the brunt of that activity. In fact, National Weather Service is already issuing warnings for those states, especially for eastern Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas. Nebraska expecting, in fact, near blizzard conditions tomorrow. Strong winds as well with the system. We saw that today in California. 64 mile an hour winds in San Diego with a rain shower that passed through there earlier. An offshore oil drilling platform clocking winds at 80 miles an hour up to 115 miles an hour in some areas and seas 20 to 25 feet. Things starting to clear up now from the north on down, as we mentioned, as this storm starts to head from Mexico, and then it's going to head on out into the east. Going to take a look at the radar, as you can see most of the stuff right now down in Southern California. Lows tonight, looking for them in the 40s, and tomorrow in the 50s, back up again into the 60s, and again, our three-day forecast calling for cloudy skies tomorrow. It's going to clear up and get sunny for Tuesday and Wednesday. In fact, we'll probably see a lot of sun tomorrow more than we expected earlier today. And we should right. tell you that Tony is not dying out here. She was just running outside getting the latest weather forecast and she's a little out of Checking breath. Checking the computer. So we're cutting her uh, short a little tonight. Thanks, Tony. Thank Catch you. your breath now. Organized. Today's march was just one of many celebrations held in honor of King. Some started on Friday and continued through today. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Strong words from a strong leader, a leader who changed a nation and inspired a world. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. A warm feeling came all over my body to think I was close enough to see the man that I had such a great respect for in so many ways for the things that he believed in. And to um, 
joined together in the cause behind Dr. King's dream. That's ideal because he was for people. He was for the love of mankind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. He's not a, just a black American, he's an American, and I'm American, we are just Americans. We just happen to be black, it's not our fault. We are Americans. I have a dream. I just became hysterical. I cried just like I did when both John and Robert Kennedy were killed. It was such a deep feeling of loss of a human being that meant so much to so many. Land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And on his tombstone it reads, Behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what will become of his dreams. Martin Luther King Jr. would have been 59 this month. You're going to Amy Lewis story, Graham? Yeah. Guess somebody probably had to fill him in on that one, too. <laughs> hey! God! I saw that thing coming. You could have heard somebody doing that. Joe, did you throw that? Whoa! <laughs> oh, he got... Now, Joe, now come on, I'm trying to do a tease here. No, I. <laughs> Let's do this. Go, Rod, roll the tape. As it inspiring questions from all angles and sometimes very loudly. Our Graham Ledger in the newsroom now with results of that meeting. Graham? Joe, many residents of Moss Landing are still refusing to go back to their boats and homes tonight, despite being told the area is safe. The question they have is safe by whose standards? Tonight, they found out. Six o'clock Thursday, more than three and a half days after the explosion, and hazardous waste crews are still mopping up the asbestos-ridden danger zone. But will all the danger ever be removed? That's the dilemma facing workers and residents here. It's one they're meeting with extreme skepticism. How do you distinguish C dock from B dock? And they're 60 feet away. How many things are we supposed to tolerate before we drop dead of some damn great disease? Tonight, a chance to ask why, and a chance for PG&E to give some answers. Why did it take so long to inform the people of this community what had happened and what the da potential dangers were. The reason that the failure occurred a little after midnight and the regulatory agencies weren't notified until early the next morning is simply because those people involved did not recognize a hazard. Question to the health department. Who gave the okay for residents to go back? That's the judgment I made and that's the decision I made. Question to the air pollution control board. Is it safe? I'm not suggesting that there is no problem, and I'm not suggesting there is a problem because the data isn't there, and I can't tell you that right now. Nearly four days after the accident, and the questions continue. <laughs> Concerned residents firing questions from all angles and sometimes very loudly. Uh, Graham Ledger in the newsroom now with results of that meeting. Graham? Joe, many residents of Moss Landing are still refusing to go back to their boats and homes tonight, despite being told the area is safe. The question they have is safe by whose standards? Tonight, they found out. Six o'clock Thursday, more than three and a half days after the explosion, and hazardous waste crews are still mopping up the asbestos-ridden danger zone. But will all the danger ever be removed? That's the dilemma facing workers and residents here. It's one they're meeting with extreme skepticism. How do you distinguish C-Doc from B-Doc? 
and they're 60 feet away. How many things are we supposed to tolerate before we drop dead of some damn great disease? Tonight, a chance to ask why, and a chance for PG&E to give some answers. Why did it take so long to inform the people of this community what had happened and what the da potential dangers were? The reason that the failure occurred a little after midnight and the regulatory agencies weren't notified until early the next morning is simply because those people involved did not recognize a hazard. Question to the health department. Who gave the okay for residents to go back? That's the judgment I made, and that's the decision I made. Question to the Air Pollution Control Board. Is it safe? I'm not suggesting that there is no problem, and I'm not suggesting there is a problem, because the data isn't there, and I can't tell you that right now. Nearly four days after the accident, and the questions continue to outnumber the answers. If it was your boat on VDOC, would you go back? I walked around the harbor on Tuesday morning with the plant manager, Ron Williams. Um, I think if it were my boat, I would at least go and take a look. Would you go back? I have been told that there has been no health hazard, and I believe our plant people when they tell me that. Is that a yes? <laughs> you know, is that a yes? cut down. No cut. cut down. Is that a yes? I'm just, I'm just asking you, would you go back? Yes, I would. Now, obviously, no one, even the scientists, know for sure if it's safe, and for that matter, exactly how much danger those in Moss Landing were exposed to. Now, officials are awaiting lab tests from air samples. Those should be in by Friday, but make no mistake, there is plenty of asbestos still around the harbor. Now, is that their greatest concern, uh, the, the residents and the workers there, Graham, or are they more concerned about the fact that perhaps they don't know everything there is to know yet? That is one of their uh, great concerns right now. Number one, of course, is health. They want to know if they're going to develop asbestosis, which, of course, is fatal. But one more thing which was rather interesting, they seem to feel that officials are downplaying the importance of this event. And they want to make clear to PG&E exactly how concerned they are. Yeah, very, very understandable. Uh, thank you, Graham. A big night for off-track betting tonight at the Monterey County Fairgrounds. This was the second day of betting and the first Friday night edition. Day two drew more people than did day one. Uh, Graham Ledger in the newsroom now with a look at uh, both sides of this question of off-track betting. Graham? Dave, the off-track, uh, excuse me, J uh, Joe, the off-track uh, betting move, a controversial one indeed. Much opposition has been raised by officials and residents alike, but that didn't stop hundreds of people from arriving to the seaside room tonight. This is the way George Ushakov of Monterey plans on spending many a Friday night. Jim! For the fire, Yours at four, Eddie, sleep! This is not the way George Ushakov plans on ending his Friday nights. How'd it do? It ran out. I think it, it ran out. It ran fifth or sixth. It had to lead there, but it ran out. Ushakov, one of more than 400 people at the fairgrounds tonight, cigar-smoking, weather-wearied racetrack veterans on one end of the floor. A couple of young women having a little fun on the other. I think it's great. It's got a good atmosphere and everything. Not what I expected at all. It's the first time I've ever bet, so it's kind of exciting that I won something. But while the betting frenzy bubbles over inside the fairgrounds, residents who live across the street are reaching a boiling point of their own. The only betting they're doing right now is that they'll lose the parking race. Well, the parking hassles and all the extra people and stuff, I mean, this is a residential area, and we have enough hassles, really, with all the other activities that go on in the fair, you know, and they really did not only take, take the neighborhood's interest in, into heart when they went ahead with the betting. But while some residents remain skeptical, Others may just have found a home away from home. So you think you'll spend a lot of Friday nights here? If my wife will let me. <laughs> well, every other Friday, maybe. That one could go down to the wire. Should be a photo finish indeed. Yesterday, when only 350 people were there, about $43,000 was wagered. Tonight's total with 400 people there should surpass that 
easily, Joe. Now that they've had a, get, a chance to get rolling out there, any noticeable kinks in the system? Well, everything seems to be running very, very smoothly right now. The only blemish I could see tonight was when the satellite feed was interrupted, but that was only momentary, Joe. Thank goodness. All right, thank you, uh, Graham. The uh, off-track betting at the fairgrounds is open for business. It's called the oldest profession, prostitution. And it is, like it or not, very much a part of our society. A part that's often considered out of sight, out of mind. Now, Graham Ledger with us now with the first of a four-part series on the politics of prostitution. Graham? Margot, Joe, the Bible calls it morally corrupt. But even before those words were written, there was prostitution. Sex for money. It is often relegated to the decadent back streets of big cities. In Salinas, its home is Soledad Street. Tonight, a look at one of those ladies of Soledad Street. A word of warning, some of this material may be considered offensive. I'll show a relaxing game of pool at the Dew Drop Inn in Salinas is a nice break from work. Except for Lori, it's not by choice. Tonight's police crackdown on Soledad Street is putting her behind the eight ball. We can't go out there and hook right now because the lights are really bad right now. This is nothing new for Lori. She's been working the streets now for 15 years. Hers has been a life of extremes. At one moment, excitement. The next, fear. It has also been a life of hard work, but big payoffs. And it's all been by choice. I guess because I've always lived a bad life. I was always a black sheep of the family. And it's just something I wanted to try. And I liked it. I liked the money rolling in. No, $10. Lori is a veteran of the streets. She has no pimp, never has. Says she doesn't need one to make money. How many tricks would you turn in an average night? Well, if it's real busy down here, I would turn at least 15 or 16. I would turn more if I can. But they don't come as fast as they used to. I used to turn like 20, 25 tricks a night. I used to make like eight, nine hundred dollars a day. Lori lives not here, but in Sacramento. She comes down to Salinas every few weeks, makes enough money to live on for a while, then goes back home. It's a long commute, but Lori says she wouldn't have it any other way. I enjoy it, not having sex. I enjoy just walking around and meeting a lot of people. We meet a lot of perverts. It is those kind of men who could have cost Lori her life. But then one time I got in a car with one guy, and it happened to be one guy in the back seat laying down, coming from behind me, grabbing me from my neck. But uh, I was lucky enough to open the door and just jump out while the car was rolling. Uh, I've had a lot of bad things happen to me, but you know, lucky thing, I'm still alive. Staying alive is the name of the game on the streets. It's all part of the job. But for Lori, there is always the inherent fear that the next car door she opens could be her last. Open the door! It's dangerous. It really is. And um, I keep saying I want to quit. I want to quit, 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 but I don't. It's like, it's just in me. They say once a hooker, always a hooker. To Lori, prostitution is just a job, a job she loves to hate. And Lori says she doesn't see herself doing this forever. She hopes one day to settle down and start a family just like anybody else. Now, Graham, prostitution is illegal here. Doesn't she worry about getting arrested? She doesn't seem to be when I was talking with her. Uh, she's only been arrested a couple of times in Salinas, and she's been on the streets now for 15 years, as you heard. Uh, however, the police are cracking down very hard on prostitution right now, and we'll look at that tomorrow in uh, part two. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Graham. Graham. Hi, how you doing? That's good. Looking for something special? It has become a common sight on Soledad Street in Salinas. Flowers of the night waiting for bees to come buzzing by. They never have to wait very long. How much for what? For me? Or how much are you willing to spend? Only tonight, this flower has thorns. She is wired with a hidden microphone, a police decoy, the major weapon in the arsenal against prostitution. We place the, uh, the female decoy in on a street corner in a um, place where it is frequented by uh, known prostitutes as well as uh, by their customers. Police decoy operations typically work in three stages. The bait. How much are you going to spend? 
$20? Okay, what did you want to do for $20, Ken? The bite. Go down to the stuff, Ken, and I'll get in, okay? And the bust. So you might want to pass the word in Hollister, Octavio. Uh, we don't joke in tonight about prostitution. The question is, is the police crackdown on prostitution working? After all, this is the world's oldest profession. According to detectives, yes, the operation netting some 500 men and women over the past year. But the streets? Well, they echo a different answer. No, it's not doing a bit of good. I mean, you know, we can come out here in the daytime, still make our money. It can't be a losing battle anytime you have less uh, females coming into the city to apply their trade. But the bottom line remains economics, the law of supply and demand. As long as men demand, prostitutes will supply. I'll three of you $100? Yeah. Go down to that stop sign right there and I'll meet you right there. Right. I'm not going to get in here because I don't want no cops yeah. stopping us, okay? And as long as prostitutes supply, police will be trying to suppress. In Salinas, Graham Ledger, Action News 8. It is 10 a.m. just outside Washoe County, Nevada, and Christy is getting ready for work. In her business, looks count. Everything, hair, makeup, clothes must be just right. Just over the river is Washoe County. Now, if Christy was going to work in Washoe County, she'd be breaking the law. But just cross this narrow one-lane bridge, and it's another story. Story County, that is. And here, her work is legal. Christy is a prostitute just down the road at the Mustang Ranch. Why am I here? Making money. And doing it legally. Christy is one of 50 women cooling their heels at the Mustang Ranch, one of the few places in the U.S. prostitution and politics go hand in hand. You can come in here as, and go to work without the problems of having a pimp. Your money is your own. Your time is your own. Uh, you're, you don't need drugs. Uh, it's, they can, it's just a job. It's just like if you're going to an office, they consider it that. But once the doors of the Mustang open, it becomes clear, crystal clear, this is like so this no is office of the anywhere. Wings, yeah, this, this is, is the, the, the main wing. Well, this is more of the working wing, you could say, because uh -huh. it has the spa, it has the VIP room, it has the salon, also the laundry room. Mustang is a far cry from the fabled few trailers nailed together of 20 years ago. Today, it is two buildings with a maze of dozens of rooms and suites. <laughs> the women at Mustang represent a carefully chosen cross-section of America's prostitutes. Most say they're happy working here, that they're in it for the money, and that they're getting out soon. Why is a girl at the Mustang Ranch? Well, I think it's a great place for a girl to come because she can make a lot of money and spoil herself to death and get all the things she wants, and it's legal. Legal as of January 1st, 1971. For Mustang's renowned owner, Joe Conforti, a banner day, a day that was inevitable. Since it could not be eliminated, um, then the intelligent way, the common sense way, is to control it and legalize it, like it is here. When prostitution became legal 17 years ago, Bob Del Carlo became sheriff of Story County. The two have yet to part ways. We feel it's well controlled. Uh, the uh, the uh, ladies that work in these places are uh, policed uh, uh, very stringently by our state health department. Policed by the ladies as well. Once a customer makes his choice, the girl makes her own health check. And at that time, the man takes the girl to the room and they'll negotiate a price. And when that is settled and the girl comes in and she checks in her money, and it goes back to the room, uh, and then goes on with her party. A party that, if held some 50 feet to the west, would be punishable by law. But here, prostitution is law. In Washoe County, Nevada, Graham Ledger, Action News 8. It is the dance of the streets, the sounds of prostitutes tiptoeing between morality, sexuality, and illegality. 
Put simply, street prostitution is a tactical triangle. Prostitutes looking for men, men looking for prostitutes, and police looking to stop both. It's a war with no ceasefire in sight. As long as there's still hookers out there and there's still Johns to Johns or male customers coming around, uh, as far as I know, we're going to continue attacking the problem. But while police are hard at work trying to curb street walkers, others are working just as hard to keep them on the streets. Here in San Francisco in this building, a group is pushing to legalize prostitution in California. They are the coyotes, and they're hungry for legislation. Coyote. Priscilla Alexander is a woman with a mission to remove the stigma of women having sex for money. Prostitution has always been sort of controlled by police and pimps, and we're trying to say that the women have to have more control. Self-determination is what Coyote is hunting for, but that will take changing California law, legislation since World War I banning prostitution. I may be beginning to find legislators who are willing to carry legislation. That doesn't mean it'll pass. Mm -hmm. And probably, if by some miracle it passed, Duke Majin would veto it. Yes, Enter this, this man, important. Joe Conforti, owner of Nevada's famed Mustang Ranch. The two may not know it, but they're on a collision course aimed at the same target. Conforti is gunning for his brand of prostitution, legal prostitution, across state lines and into California. We can't eliminate it. We're not giving anything new. It's here. Let's control and put it in the right place. Under Conforti's plan, prostitution would be tightly controlled by a special state police force funded by a prostitute tax. Only the girls should get the money, the girls who work. They should get it all, 100%. And they would pay a certain tax for licensing or for whatever. And if the legalization legislation stalls in Sacramento, Conforti says he'll take it to the voters. If it's brought out the right way to the public, and even to the police agencies, if it's brought out the right way, that I'm very confident that it will, uh, it will pass. Do you consider what uh, we see in Nevada a role model? No, no, that's a prison. No matter how it's packaged, legalization in California is still remote. And if you ask ladies on the street, they'd like to keep it that way. If you legalize it, it's, it's, it's like taking a chunk out of us, you know, taking away our money that we work so hard for. Legal or illegal? On the streets or in a house, it is likely prostitution will remain the oldest profession. In Salinas, Graham Ledger, Action News 8. Festival just getting underway. Our Graham Ledger is standing by live in Monterey for the festivities. And Graham, I suppose you're doing some stargazing out there. Margo, the 1988 edition of the Monterey Film Festival is officially underway. Things kicking off here just a few minutes ago. Some of Hollywood's big names are due to arrive here, including Doris Day and Rex Reed and the special guest James Stewart. Uh, spotlights are going, limos are arriving, and the Ford Ord Band, as you heard just a few seconds ago, is playing. Everybody's here. It's a gala event, and the man behind it all is the executive director of the 1988 Monterey Film Festival, Michael Pippi. And how do you uh, think things have gotten together here this year? Things going is pretty much as planned. They're going great. So bring your, bring your pillows and blankets and come on down and participate. Last well into the wee hours of the morning, I'm sure. Definitely. Okay, sounds like a good time. Thanks very much, Michael Pippi, the executive director of the Monterey Film Festival. And uh, after the guests arrive here, it's inside to the conference center for a cocktail reception. Then the world premiere showing, as Michael said, of the film Souvenir, starring Catherine Hicks and Christopher Plummer. After that, it's across the street to the Monterey Sheraton for the world premiere party and all part of the opening ceremonies here at the 1988 Monterey Film Festival. Margo? Sounds like a big four-day event. Thanks. Center. Our Graham Ledger was there and is in the newsroom now with more on this star-studded opening. Graham? Joe, it was quite a gala affair this evening. Red carpet, limos, lights, cameras, and plenty of action. While the highlight of the 1988 edition will be Sunday's tribute to film great Jimmy Stewart, tonight's party and world premiere screening offered plenty of excitement. And I thank you again for coming tonight. It had all the elements of a Hollywood movie premiere. Big cars, big crowds, and big stars, big in stature. Another car arriving, another volley of camera flashes, 
and another chance to get a glimpse of Hollywood. Jamie Stewart and the other movie stars, all the movie stars, yes. We saw them in so many well, thank movies. You very much. Now we would the like to the see them uh, Everyone has done all the today. Work. Jimmy Stewart isn't due until later, but his co-star in the 1970 film The Cheyenne Social Club, Sue Ann Langdon, made it to honor the actor. To be really quite an event. He's a wonderful person. He's a dear, dear person. Actress Catherine Ross and actor Sam Elliott fielding questions about the relevance of the festival and questions that have little relevance about anything. What do you mean by that? You, I don't know. You're telling me you, something that you, you know, maybe that I, I don't I'm know. Ready. Ask the woman who knows the difference between good and bad, and she'll tell you about the festival's relevance. Oh, I think, I think this has a long history, and it's going to be one of the most prized festivals to be a part of. And the biggest part of this night, the world premiere showing of the film Souvenir, starring Katherine Hicks and Christopher Plummer. And after the premiere showing of uh, Souvenir, it was across the street to the Monterey Sheraton for the all-important party. Joe? All right, now that's the end of day one. How about tomorrow? What's on the agenda? Uh, a lot in store, including screenings of some two dozen films, including a sci-fi movie marathon, which starts at midnight tomorrow. Also, a Cowboys and Cossacks party, so there is still much, much more to come. Yeah, a lot of excitement. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> Protests before pomp in Moscow today as well. What was designed as a pro-government, pro-summit, officially sanctioned demonstration became an unscheduled melee. About 200 Soviet Jews joined the crowd, holding up signs protesting the government's immigration policies. Then the police arrived and a scuffle broke out. The government officials apparently not wanting the protest by Jews recorded. An NBC cameraman was punched during the conflict, and a CNN reporter arrested and detained for four hours. 25 Jews were also arrested and detained. The rain that will fall tonight is a drizzle compared to the drenching and battering we got today. The biggest winter storm so far roared through the central coast earlier today, leaving high tides and downed trees in its wake. Even though more bad weather is on the way, our John Lovertini tells us we've seen the worst of this storm. Uh, Graham Ledger back now from the scene and uh, has more from the newsroom. Graham? Joe, in all more than 160 gallons of ethyl ether were found just off Highway 129. For a time, authorities thought the barrels may have leaked, spilling the highly flammable substance. That's when the order was given to close 129. The highway was closed to all traffic between Rogie Lane to the west and the intersection of 101 to the east. Somewhere in between, along the side of the road, four barrels filled with the highly flammable chemical ethyl ether. Authorities first found the barrels late this afternoon. At that time, the theory was that the ethyl ether fell off a truck. But after closer inspection by Santa Cruz County Sheriff's investigators, and because there's no turn in the road here, authorities came up with another theory, that the barrels of ethyl ether were dumped over the embankment on purpose by drug lab operators. We don't know how they could fall off a truck and get, get over there, so we now believe it was deliberately dumped. A hazardous chemical disposal company rolled to the scene and began the tedious task of placing each barrel in a larger barrel for transport. One by one, and very carefully, Caltrans crews hoisted the drums up the embankment. Clearly marked on each barrel of ethyl ether, AMA Shipping Company, Miami, Florida. From your experience, what is something like this used for? Uh, drug labs, that's, in fact, I just picked up some yesterday, ethyl ether, the same exact stuff, 12 five-gallon cans. Like these drums, those two were dumped along the side of the road. Authorities say this scene is becoming more and more common as the crackdown on crank labs continues. Again, uh, no leakage from the four 55-gallon drums. Three were full, the fourth about half full. They'll be transported to Southern California to a disposal company and then taken to Texas for incineration. Joe? Now, Graham, you mentioned uh, the crackdown on drug labs. Does that have anything to do with the, the, the dumping of these barrels, perhaps, along the side of the road? Well, the theory being, and once again, this is just conjecture, that the drug lab operators were feeling the heat from local authorities, maybe an investigation, and closed up shop rather hastily and dumped the barrels of ethyl ether wherever they could, in this case, along Highway 129. Makes sense. Thank you, Graham.
KSBW 8. The news starts now. From the most watched station on the Central Coast. Graham Ledger, Maya Carroll, Tony Chappelle Weather, Pete Delgado Sports. This is Action News 8. Weekend. Good evening. At 11 o'clock, four people are listed in serious condition tonight at Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital. Victims of a plane crash. Their small plane crashing this afternoon at Shalone Winery in Soledad. The two men and two women somehow escaping death. Any bank made a left turn, and I knew right away that he wasn't going to make it out of here. Larry Demurici was right. The single-engine plane clipping some trees, plowing into a field, then coming to a halt at the base of a tree. The fuselage twisted like so much scrap metal, trapping the two men inside. He was coming in for a landing, and then he went behind the hill where I couldn't see him any longer. And then when he came over the hill to the other end of the runway, uh, he had aborted the, t the landing, and he didn't have enough power to make it all the way over the hill. The pilot was apparently trying to land at an airstrip adjacent to the vineyard. A weekend trip to the winery falling a few tragic feet short. Rescue workers hiked a good hundred yards to reach the four victims. One was loaded into an ambulance, the other three into a massed helicopter. For a time, there was concern that the chopper might be overloaded, that it might be too heavy to take off. The pilot tentatively lifting off the ground hesitating, then finally turning toward his destination, Salinas Airport. Now from there, the victims were taken to Salinas Valley Memorial. They are all from Marin County, California. The Federal Aviation Administration has been called in to investigate the accident. A breakfast sandwich and large drink. Myrtle with Mamu, the kissing whale. The test... The test of wills in Panama continues. Now, opposition leader... Back here on the Central Coast, money also the root of problems for the moderate diocese. The diocese, more than a million dollars in debt from Pope John Paul II's visit here last year. According to diocese officials, fundraising efforts have not gone well. They were hoping other Northern California churches would help minimize the debt, but that is proving less than fruitful. Diocese officials are hoping to announce new plans sometime soon. Plans they hope will resolve this financial debt. And now our Graham Ledger standing by with a live report. Graham, have they left yet? Paul, it is happening right now. Uh, the choppers, 26 in all, will be taking off from Fort Ord throughout the day. They include 15 Black Hawk troop carriers like the one you're looking at right now, seven Cobra attack choppers, and five Kiowa scouts. Now it is the Cobras that are reportedly being deployed as they would for combat. And that means they are fully loaded. As you watch this Black Hawk hover, he is not taking off, he's hovering right now, just checking the equipment. Now back to the Cobras, that means they are fully armed with machine guns, rockets, and missiles. From there, they will fly to Travis Air Force Base. They'll be loaded in C-141 and C-5 transport planes. And from there, it is on to Panama. Now, military officials are stressing this is not, not an exercise like uh, the troops had in Honduras. This is a peacekeeping force to keep security in Panama right now, Paul. Officials saying not an exercise for security. Have you been able to talk to any of the soldiers? What are they talking about? We talked to a couple of the pilots just minutes ago, and they said they're looking forward to this. Of course, uh, they're trained for this sort of thing, and they're anxious to get going. Do they have any idea how long they're going to be down there this time, Graham? Mil military officials won't come in. Second the motion. The meeting's adjourned. <laughs> the meeting's adjourned. <laughs> Son, down by the sea to a place not far from my home. A quiet little village where they'll bust you for an ice cream cone. They outlawed neon lights. You get light for an electric guitar. Just oil paintings and t shirt shops and one big shining star. Better stay out of his way. Just go ahead. West 
coast, their road and east wood. Clint may have had to squint, but he saw just what he should. He knew he didn't like the way the things were run. So he said, just call me mayor. And he loaded up his gun. Well, the impact was awful sudden. Not bad and ugly, but good. Cause every which way there were fistful adults with t-shirts of Mayor Eastwood. Kinda raw, but he didn't hide. And as hairy as it might get, he knew the job was dirty. But somebody had to do it. All the writers, they turned pale When the mayor strolled in and he said with a grin We're gonna change the name of Carmel He said, hell is more like it If you gotta use a John, you're doomed All these folks come to Hog's Breath Inn Just to use my bathroom It's only natural. Look where Ronnie Reagan went. I can see the t-shirt now saying Clint for president. Now when I want to see a movie, some action hard and fast, I just go down to Carmel and watch Clint kick some. to somebody. Just have her script. Where is she? Tina! Yes! Yes! I don't have a script in my head. I don't have a script! Tell her I need a script. She's coming. No, I need one minute. No script. Come on. Script. Get the fuck in here! Tell her to bring the fucking script! Okay, hurry up, hurry up. On Close Up this morning, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. It was two years ago today that American warplanes bombed and strafed Libya, striking directly at the Libyan strongman. At the time, George Shultz claimed Gaddafi was finished in international politics. But our foreign editor, Henry Champ, has a different impression. He's just back from Libya and joins us this morning from our newsroom in London. Good morning, Henry. Good morning, Bryant. Whenever there is an act of terrorism, or Gaddafi's name has become a... Sorry, well, I'll start that again, Brian. Whenever there is an act of terrorism, whenever G and Gaddafi's name will become a matter of speculation, and with some reason. The Libyan leader's links to terrorism have been proven. For nearly two decades now, this Middle Eastern gadfly has stumbled across the international stage, bobbing from one mistake of judgment to another. But his instincts are much sharper when it comes to domestic issues. Two years after the American raid on Tripoli, the colonel is firmly in charge back home. Jesus Christ. Right. 
McCune, please. Two years ago, when Clint please. Eastwood became mayor of Carmel, sound. a local rock group wrote a Lose song about it. But with Eastwood leaving office, the song is now part of the past, sadly. However, yes, in tonight's cover story, we find out the mayor is Roll the 11. subject of a new musical school. Take. It all started back in 1986. Clint Eastwood riding into town on a platform of restrooms and ice cream. The rock group The Medflies riding the mayoral phenomenon to the top of the charts. But it's two years later now, the mayor's term is over, and the Medflies have a new song. This song, like the other, was written by Carl Chris, a devout Eastwood fan. I wanted to touch on the Carmel issues that he's gone through in the last two years. Uh, for two years, he's walked the tightrope. Right? Because you know, there's been people that are kind of like iffy about him for a while. And there's been heartbreaks on that damn ridge. And those are two movie titles. And it's damn D-A-M, the Carmel Valley Dam. Now, two years, he's walked the tightrope. With heartbreaks on that damn ridge. And now that he's tied with the Pope, some say it's sacrilege. Bye. And then there's the reference hey, to singer Sonny Bono, oh, now you're who back. just this week was elected I mayor was, uh, of Palm Springs. Right but he's How much larger is he going to get Joe Glover out here? I don't know. I think Dennis is not happy. Can share two jobs and yeah, he was pissed because, because on his script it said um, to come back at a certain time. Yeah, and you came back get like it. He's running out of time. He went 15 seconds over. I think a lot of people are going to miss him. He said yeah, he was adored Chris, by his teammates all, or whatever, and we didn't soon see Soon there'll be one last well, thing to sing about. Well, I was trying to get out so we get out on time. That's why. Oh, well. So, I mean, anyway. Uh, stand, grab all by. In five. Step out of fade. Fade the audio. Take it and cue Graham. And how the Med Flies so are currently working on a new video for their with Mr. Mayor song. So it should be released off, sometime on your card. soon. Fit, Still ahead on Action News 8 at 5, we'll check in with Joe Glover for a preview of the news at 6. We'll be right Solve back. Card. It all started back in 1986. Clint Eastwood riding into town on a platform of restrooms and ice. Retirement plan involves playing golf. Why not? Huh? It certainly does. Dave, you know, when you're young, you tend to put off planning for retirement. But did you know that only about 2% of the population retains their standard of living during retirement? It's something to think about. And somebody who did think about just that is Charlie Loveless. He is joining me now at a place where he spends many an afternoon at the Salinas Fairways. Charlie, how did you plan for retirement? Well, when I was younger, I never give too much. Action News 8's Graham Ledger is standing by now in Salinas with more. Graham? Joe, the three men arrested today, which include the owner of the Brass Rail restaurant, are charged with possession of cocaine only. That's according to the Sheriff's Department. The other two were arrested Tuesday, and they include one of the former owners of the Tea and Turf restaurant. Those men face a whole gambit of charges, ranging from possession to sale of cocaine. Yes. 47 seconds. The three defendants appearing in court this afternoon for arraignment. From left to right, they are William Bernadeci, George Bernadeci, and Bobby Franchoni. Judge Stephen Silman reading off the long list of charges. Count 12, you're charged with possessing cocaine for sale in violation of 11351 as a felony, and an enhancement is having more than a half ounce of cocaine. The arrest of the three men culminates a three-month-long investigation. The Sheriff's Department Tuesday issuing a whole host of search warrants, like here at the Palace Restaurant in Gonzales, owned by Bobby Franchoni. I think the term significant is proper uh, in that regard, probably 10 kilos per month uh, passing through this organization. A former employee of the Palace Restaurant who didn't want to go on camera says the sale of drugs was a daily part of business here and that Franchoni was blatant about it, even using a pager to make his deals. Uh, this is huge quantities of cocaine that's been uh, stopped, uh, wholesalers. District Attorney Michael Bartram says they've built a very strong case against the three defendants, that they are major cocaine kingpins, and that it's a key bust in the ongoing war on drugs. Definitely a key case. Uh, a lot of the cocaine supply is dried up by these arrests. <laughs> As he was leaving the courthouse today, Franchoni saying he's innocent. 
and that he'll prove it. Uh, I don't know what it is. I can't believe they're going to hear from me. Are you going to fight this one all the way? Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. Now, joining me now is the owner of the Brass Rail restaurant, John Saunders. Uh, the Sheriff's Department saying he was arrested for possession of cocaine today. John, were you arrested for possession of cocaine? No, I was not. Now, uh, they searched the Brass Rail, your restaurant. They searched your home. As far as you know, did they find any cocaine today? No, nothing. Why do you think uh, you're singled out uh, among this cocaine conspiracy? I have no idea. It's something to do with restaurants, maybe. Okay. Thanks very much, John Saunders. Maybe we'll find out more as this unravels. Now, the arraignment proceedings for the other three men were delayed today because one of the Bernard Durchies is uh, still securing counsel. They'll be back in court, however, tomorrow for arraignment. And right now, their bail stands at $1 million each. Joe? Graham, according to officers, how much cocaine has been seized in these arrests? Well, now, even though you heard they trafficked as much as uh, 10 kilos a month through the Salinas area, at the time of arrest, only 18 ounces of cocaine. Uh, several cars were confiscated, as well as $55,000, but authorities truly believe they have cracked open one of the major drug rings in the Salinas area. Thank you, Graham. The uh, sheriffs of several prominent and respected Central Coast residents. Uh, Graham Ledger has been following this story and is in the newsroom now with more. Graham? Joe, Action News 8 has confirmed the existence of that list. Sources close to the investigation saying at least four prominent Central Coast residents may or may not be still part of that cocaine investigation. The four Central Coast residents are listed in the investigative report. Two of them are well-known Monterey area people and are famous Monterey Cannery Row restaurant owners. The third, a large Salinas area produce grower and broker. Fourth, a prominent Salinas attorney. All four were linked to the multi-million dollar cocaine investigation. And sources tell us all were named along with the Bernadashi brothers and Bobby Franchoni by at least one confidential informant as possible associates. The Bernadashis and Franchoni are charged with trafficking kilos of cocaine through the Salinas area over the past several years. George and William Bernadashi are being held on a million dollars bail each. Franchoni is out on a quarter million dollars bond. <coughs> Now, we're not releasing the names of those four people because they haven't been charged, have not been charged or arrested in connection with this cocaine ring, and we don't want to jeopardize the ongoing investigation either. Their exact role, if any, in this cocaine ring is still as a no, Joe. Uh, but generally, what do we know? Are they just wanted as witnesses, or are they actual suspects in the case? Still not clear. The sources I have been talking with, sources close to the investigation, won't confirm whether or not the book is closed on these four people, whether or not not they are indeed suspects. They say the investigation is ongoing and pretty much still wide open. Thank you, Graham. Salinas Valley Cocaine Ring. Action News H. Graham Ledger was in court today and is now in the newsroom with more. Graham? Joe, I've read the investigative report and safe to say much of the prosecution's case relies on this confidential informant. In the report, he's known only as SRC84X013. Bobby Franchoni's attorney, Eugene Epstein, requesting last Thursday that his identity be revealed. Today, Assistant District Attorney Charles Olvis doing just that. Okay, and you prefer to do that at this time? Yes. Okay, is that written form or oral form? No. Um, uh, Chief John Griffin, 281, Catherine, number two, Salinas. His name once again, as told by Olvis, John Griffin of Salinas. Exactly what his relationship to the three key defendants was isn't clear. But in the report, Griffin implicates George and William Bernadashi, Bobby Francioni, and scores of other well-known Central Coast businessmen in the cocaine operation. It is Griffin's credibility that is key, and it's his credibility that Epstein questions. But the district attorney's office is confident about Griffin's credibility. However, Olvis conceding Griffin did much of his work on his own. Due to the nature of the case, he was on his own for most of the time. Police officers did uh, cover him on several instances, but most of the time he was on his own. Well, I think it's, it's uh, an action of fairness on his part so that we can investigate our case prior to the preliminary hearing. Yet you're not satisfied yet. Why? Well, because the detective testified that there was more than one informant and he only disclosed one. Hey, right okay. Move back. Uh -oh. No comment. Now, the investigative reports lists other informants, but again, most of the information appears to be from Griffin. It will be up to the prosecution, of course, to bolster Griffin's testimony, the defense saying they are poised to tear it apart. Joe? 
Graham, tell us a little more about John Griffin. What do we know about him? Uh, not much about him. Uh, not many people seem to know much about him. He's a Salinas resident, believed to be in his 20s, possibly his late 20s. Again, his relationship with the defendants isn't clear just yet. Also, as far as the court case goes, it has now been handed over to a magistrate, Judge Burley, hearing the case that will start up again tomorrow. Thank you, Graham. Graham Ledger is in the newsroom now with more. Graham? Joe, that investigative report is some 80 pages long. Much of it details how the three key defendants, George and William Bernardaschi and Bobby Franchoni, allegedly dealt large amounts of cocaine. That's public record, but there is more to this report. How big is this information? The investigative report details a large cocaine distribution operation throughout Monterey County, even describing how the drugs were smuggled across the U.S.-Mexico border. According to the informant, George Bernadashi explained how a Salinas Valley produce broker concealed five large boxes of cocaine, 25 kilos per box, for a total of 125 kilos each truck. The total cocaine smuggled per week is 625 kilos. The amounts that you find now being discovered, whether it's at sea or even crossing borders, are in that amount. The drugs, according to the informant, hidden among the produce. The strong odor preventing customs dogs from sniffing the cocaine out. Action News 8 spoke with that Salinas Valley grower who said today he has no idea why he's named in the investigative report. This person also says he's never met the informant, John Griffin, and says he doesn't even know the Bernadashi brothers. What's more, he denies having anything to do with drugs, says he doesn't deal them or use them. Once the cocaine arrives on the Central Coast, according to the informant, it is distributed to several sources. The report reads, the informant advised that approximately four years ago, he was making cocaine deliveries to two prominent restaurateurs in Monterey, two to 20 kilos per delivery and to a Salinas attorney, one to two ounces of cocaine every other week to his office. It's a hierarchy from a, a one main distribution point, and they're, parts of, or they're elements of that organization. That organization, according to the informant, reads like a who's who of Monterey County. Now, the report gives exact names and locations as told by the key informant and other informants. However, we're not releasing those names. They haven't been charged with any crimes yet, but the list is long and by all means damaging. And uh, who's who is uh, one of the terms you have used, Graham. Obviously not uh, your typical everyday drug user. No, they are not your typical users or pushers for that matter. They are at least part of the yuppie set on the Central Coast, if not the very successful set, which seems to be indicative of the drug cocaine itself. But talking with the attorney of one of the people on that list, he says the informant, the key informant, is wrong and will be proven so. Thank you, Graham. Weekend. Good evening. At 11 o'clock, a family, a school, a city mourns the death of a teenager tonight. 18-year-old Stacy Mead, a graduating senior at Notre Dame High School in Salinas, was killed yesterday in a car accident. Her loss hitting like a ton of bricks at today's memorial service. The shock and utter disbelief of Stacy Mead's death, almost too much for friends to handle. At the service, a reading, a gut-wrenching reading of a term paper written just a week ago by Stacy. It reads, I think my dad and mom give my life meaning. I believe that God maps out our lives for us. I can't imagine my life without God. He gives my whole life meaning and existence. She goes on to say, I really love and respect my family and God with all my heart. Afterwards, outside Stacy's school, pictures in pain, in solitude, in disbelief. Offers of comfort, a brush away of a tear, a final kiss, and goodbye. Uh, Stacy would have graduated with the rest of her class in ceremonies tomorrow. Um, according to this informant, Graham? Well, the amounts of cocaine John Griffin reports were being dealt are mind-boggling to most people, easily in the millions of dollars. Example, two days in May, as told by Griffin, beginning just after midnight, May 1st, 1988, following a phone call between the informant Griffin and George Bernardaschi. At 1 a.m., the first delivery was made here, according to Griffin, at Spence Road and Highway 101. George Bernardaschi driving his BMW, meeting his brother, William, who was driving a late model Cadillac. Now, according to Griffin, William gave George four suitcases, two of which were put in the trunk of the BMW. From here, George Bernardaschi drove that BMW to Gonzalez. 
Just after one, the informant and George Bernardaschi arrive at the Palace Bar in Gonzales. According to Griffin, Bernardaschi takes one of the suitcases into the bar. Minutes later, Bernardaschi returns and says he gave Francione the same amount as Sunday. 1.30 a.m. According to Griffin, Bernardaschi drives to the rear of the pub restaurant in Salinas. He meets a woman waiting in a car and gives her a suitcase. When she opens it, the informant sees three kilos of cocaine. 1.50 a.m. According to Griffin, he and Bernardaschi meet a man behind the Italian Villa restaurant in Salinas. A suitcase with three kilos inside is given to the man. He gives Bernardaschi a large stack of money. 1988, 9.30 p.m. According to Griffin, he and George Bernadaschi drive a pickup truck to Hollister Airport. They meet a man warming up a twin-engine airplane. At that point, Griffin says he unloaded five suitcases from George Bernadaschi's pickup truck. Four were apparently empty, the fifth weighing about 40 pounds. Bernadaschi then loading all five into the awaiting plane. Now, if what Griffin says is true, that one loaded suitcase was filled with cocaine. Street value, up to $2 million. 11 p.m. According to Griffin, Bernadaschi enters the Brass Rail restaurant and meets with owner John Saunders. The informant states Bernadaschi gives Saunders what looks like an ounce of cocaine in exchange for $500. The transaction, the report says, taking place at the bar. Now, all this once again, as told by informant John Griffin, detailed in the federal investigative report. What we just outlined was only two or three pages in a report, Joe and Margo, that is 80 or 90 pages long. It's wires, no plumbing, and dirt floors, all just a few miles from the heart of Salinas. It is the fourth such closure this year. Graham Ledger is standing by live at the camp east of Salinas with more. Graham? Well, Margo, the thing that health officials were most concerned about, the fact that children were living here. 25 out of the 90 people living here were children. They lived in sheds that also stored pesticides in trailers with no electricity electricity nor running water. It's enough to turn most people's stomachs. Bags of ammonia sulfate fertilizer for bedding. Dirt floors used for cooking as well as human waste. And insects everywhere. Also the fact that they were uh, sleeping in several trailers that had hazardous wiring and other conditions. And sewage was flowing on top of the ground, garbage on top of the ground, and extremely hazardous for the people occupying. Should they have shut it down? Yeah, they should. I mean, it is true, nobody should be living here. 14 year old Lisa Munoz lives at the camp. Well, it's just, it has to be hanged closed because it's not really any place for anybody to live. Munoz is one of the lucky ones. The house she lives in barely met health code, as did an adjacent labor camp. There were th things to be. Uh, Corrections to be made. I mean, that were structural and marginal things that were that would improve the sanitation aspects. Of sanitation aspects like this faucet, the only source of water that must be carried by bucket some 100 feet into their home. The living conditions at the adjacent labor camp aren't much better than what you see here. The labor contractor for that camp had one explanation for the poor living conditions. He said it's better than what they had in Mexico. This is the camp's operator, Armando Huerta. While he vows to comply to the health department's codes, those who live in his trailer aren't so sure. They say if the camp is closed, They'll stay until police kick them out because there's nowhere else to go. Now, what happens to the operators of the camp that was shut down? Well, they face misdemeanor charges. I say only misdemeanor charges because the fine and the jail term are both minimal. There are four men facing those charges. Now, it's up to the district attorney to decide whether or not to go after the owners of this property as well. Margo? Now, Graham, what happens to the people who were living at the camp? Where are they tonight? Ninety people is a lot to uh, try and relocate all at once, but Walter Wong of the health department assures me that all of them have been or are in the process of being relocated to other legal camps in the Central Coast. Okay, thanks. This is Action News 8 Weekend. Good evening. At 11 o'clock, the high-stakes, high-finance game of presidential politics is shifting into high gear tonight. 
Atlanta is the place, the site of the Democratic National Convention, and today delegates began arriving. Actually, they're pouring into the southern city by plane and by bus. They're being met with warm, sticky weather, but helpful hospitality. Meantime, workers are still putting the finishing touches on the convention hall, the Omni Coliseum, where more than 5,000 people are expected. Delegates hoping to put the finishing touches on their convention complexion. Michael Dukakis saying the central issue will be the economic future of America. As for Jesse Jackson, his arrival in Atlanta today kicked up a dust of uncertainty, but as Robert Hager reports, Jackson and Dukakis aides worked behind the scenes today to try and close the gap between the Austin-Boston connection and the Rainbow Coalition. Thousands of people took to the streets of Mexico City today, protesting Mexico's recent national elections. Upwards of 300,000 demonstrators rallied with defeated presidential candidate Katima Cardenas. They charged the governing party with election fraud. The ruling party, which has governed Mexico since 1929, won by the smallest margin in decades. Store owners in Santa Cruz are cleaning up tonight after being hit by a round of graffiti. 17 businesses along the 1500 block of Pacific Avenue were the targets of three Santa Cruz residents, suspects in the vandalism. Police say damage may soar to $5,000. The three were arrested and are facing charges of felony vandalism. This is Action News 8 Weekend. Good evening. At 11 o'clock, the countdown to the Democratic National Convention is on tonight. All eyes shift to the south, to Atlanta, Georgia, to see if the Democrats can change their image and the political tide in America. The Democrats, led, of course, by this man, Michael Dukakis. Dukakis arriving in Atlanta today after wrestling with budget problems at home in Massachusetts. The governor saying he expects a united party despite grumblings from the Jackson camp. We hope and expect to launch a winning campaign. Uh, we're going to be uh, enjoying our stay here, obviously uh, working hard to make sure that we have a good convention, a strong and united party. And Dukak is also saying he and Jesse Jackson know, like, and respect each other. The key, of course, which unlocks the Democratic door to the future, the 4,000-plus delegates. California's delegates don't consider the Dukakis-Jackson controversy a major stumbling block. Action News 8's Gary Nuremberg looks at local leaders turned delegates in Atlanta. The senior senator from California, Alan Cranston, among the long list of high-ranking Democratic leaders in Atlanta right now, Cranston is hoping to help heal wounds suffered by the Democratic Party from the Dukakis-Jackson conflict. The Senate Majority Whip saying he's hopeful the two sides will reach agreement. I'm confident. Yeah. A fire is raging out of control north of San Luis Obispo at this hour. More than 500 acres have burned so far. Two mountain roads have been closed and residents of a small town are being told to get ready to leave quickly. The wildfire is blackening and being fueled by tinder dry chaparral. Five air tankers and two helicopters and about 300 firefighters are battling that blaze. Very little weather relief in sight for parts of the Central Coast tomorrow. It's going to be another very hot day. Today, temperatures soared past the century mark in several communities. King City, one of the hottest spots on the local map. Action News 8's Maya Carroll tells us folks there are bearing unbearable weather. A truck driver is in good condition tonight, recovering from injuries received when a train crashed into his rig today. The accident happened just off Highway 1 in Marina at about 11 this morning. According to the California Highway Patrol, the truck driver was trying to enter the Bud Antle plant. And that, they tell us, is when the train came. The engineer applying the emergency brakes, but it was too late and the collision ensued. The truck driver, Lawrence Hamilton of Missouri, says his rig stalled on the tracks. Hamilton was treated 